Hello, and welcome to our second Sister Vegan Conference, The Vegan Praxis of Black Lives Matter. My name is Dr. Amy Breeze Harper, and I'm the founder of the Sister Vegan Project and the organizer of the conference you're attending today. Back in 2012, the Sister Vegan Project became familiar with the movement and website Black Lives Matter. The Black Lives Matter movement, rooted in a Black feminist queer perspective, aligned very much with the Sister Vegan Project's own tenets of justice and liberation for Black identified people throughout the African diaspora. The Black Lives Matter founders were not only focusing on cisgender Black male victims of militarized police state violence. Literally, all Black Lives Matter, queer, trans, differently abled, incarcerated, etc. Black Lives Matter is a movement and not simply a moment. I really want to read the exact quote from the Black Lives Matter website because I want to make sure everyone knows the purpose of the movement and that it's a continuum Black struggle against legacies of colonialism and antebellum racism. The founders of the movement write, quote, Black Lives Matter was created in 2012 after Trevon Martin's murderer, George Zimmerman, was acquitted for his crime, and dead 17-year-old Trevon was posthumously placed on trial for his own murder. Rooted in the experiences of Black people in this country who actively resist our dehumanization, Black Lives Matter is a call to action and a response to the virulent anti-Black racism that permeates our society. Black Lives Matter is a unique contribution that goes beyond extrajudicial killings of Black people by police and vigilantes. It goes beyond the narrow nationalism that can be prevalent within Black communities, which merely call on Black people to love Black, live Black, and buy Black, keeping straight cis Black men in the front of the movement while our sisters, queer and trans and disabled folk, take up roles in the background or not at all. Black Lives Matter affirms the lives of Black queer and trans folk, disabled folk, Black undocumented folk, folks with records, women, and all Black lives along the gender spectrum. It centers those that have been marginalized within Black liberation movements. It is a tactic to rebuild the Black liberation movement. When we say Black Lives Matter, we are broadening the conversation around state violence to include all of the ways in which Black people are intentionally left powerless at the hands of the state. We are talking about the ways in which Black lives are deprived of our basic human rights and dignity, how Black poverty and genocide is state violence, how 2.8 million Black people are locked in cages in this country is state violence, how Black women bearing the burden of a relentless assault on our children and our families is state violence, how Black queer and trans folk bear a unique burden from a heteropatriarchal society that disposes of us like garbage and simultaneously fetishizes us and profits off of us, and that is state violence. How a half a million Black people in the U.S. are undocumented immigrants and relegated to the shadows. How Black girls are used as negotiating chips during times of conflict and war. End quote. Over the past decade, I, the founder of the Sister Vegan Project, have engaged critical race and critical whiteness analysis of the North American vegan movement relentlessly. It has been clear to me that the mainstream rhetoric within the vegan movement does little to acknowledge that Black lives matter. This is due to a post-racial, post-human vegan praxis, in my opinion. When confronted with this fact by mostly non-white and anti-racist people, vegan or not, the collectivity of white neoliberal minded vegans respond frequently in defensiveness. They collectively respond with verbal violence, victim blaming, and or confidently express that incorporating anti-racism and critical whiteness awareness into their vegan praxis is too distracting towards their goals of non-human animal liberation. For me, the response itself speaks volumes of the white privilege imbued in being able to find issues of race, racism, and racialization quote unquote, too inconvenient to consider. And this speaks volumes of how neoliberal whiteness significantly influences vegan praxis. So how am I defining vegan praxis for this conference? The root of the concept of veganism is ahimsa, which means harmlessness and nonviolence applied to all people and non-human animals, as well as the earth's resources. In this sense, I'm not focusing on the single issue definition that most mainstream people think of 
when vegan or veganism is mentioned, i.e. animal rights only, and only through buying vegan labeled products and being a PETA supporter. I'm grounding dismantling systemic racism, black liberation and challenging neoliberal whiteness within an ahimsa framework, if that makes sense. Praxis means you just don't accept dogma and then uncritically use that dogma as a logic for your actions, which many of us, at least here in the USA where the Sister Vegan Project is based, are trained to do via K through 12 educational system. When I speak of praxis, I'm speaking of the thoughtful and critical actions one takes to change the world for the better. I draw from Paulo Freire's and Bell Hooks's notion of praxis that focuses on empowering the oppressed people of the world to free themselves through critical inquiry, reflection, and ongoing transformation. What philosophies and theories undergird your practices and why? Praxis means you learn from critical observations and exchanges with other people, engage in critical reflexivity with yourself, and produce more thoughtful ways to create freedom for yourself and other oppressed beings in the world that resist the taken-for-granted logic of capitalist colonialist configurations of power, i.e. racial hierarchies of power, heteronormativity, human domination, and abuse of non-human animals. The Vegan Praxis of Black Lives Matter Conference essentially means we're using Black feminist queer theorizing to understand how Black people have historically to the present been excluded from justice and power, structurally, systemically, and institutionally, and how this affects or should shape vegan philosophies. What is this concept of neoliberal whiteness? And I have that in the title of the conference. Neoliberal whiteness is a concept I developed to really understand how whiteness operates during an era of globalized neoliberal capitalism in a supposed post-colonialist and post-racial society. But more specifically, amongst the white collectivity, there seems to be this sincere notion that they think that they are not consciously racist, and they don't understand that they benefit systemically from racism and white supremacist ordering of power and resources. Neoliberal whiteness purports that racism is no longer a significant impediment for non-white racialized people to achieve quote-unquote equality and human rights. The quote-unquote true racists are narrated to be Nazis, KKK members, and slave masters from antebellum era of USA. However, racism continues to be a significant impediment to liberation, health, happiness, equality for non-white people in the USA and abroad. Neoliberal whiteness is very invisible to the mainstream white population. Now, within the system of neoliberal whiteness, there still is a racial caste system in which white racialized subjects are privileged, at least as a racial group. However, it is systemic and structural as seen through phenomenon such as the current era of mass incarceration of brown and black mostly men. And you can see this in Michelle Alexandra's book, The New Jim Crow. You can see this in the phenomenon of environmental racism. For example, you'd rarely if ever find an incinerator near a white suburban neighborhood. You'd find it in poor communities of color. You can also see this phenomenon in food deserts, as well as racial coding of words, such as, quote unquote, a good neighborhood or a good school, which usually means, quote unquote, white. Neoliberal whiteness is also rooted in the belief that the free market via better managed capitalism will become the great equalizer. And I see this belief as bedrock for the ethical consumption of vegan mainstream movement and buying power is taught as the way to make positive changes. However, this way of thinking is problematic because it assumes that everyone has the buying power to actively and fairly engage in the free market. Those who have the most dollars, economic and political power, to determine where their money goes are white, middle to upper class people of the world. Not just within veganism and other ethical consumption movements in the USA, but across the board in just about everything. But most white liberals don't realize how they got to the point that they have the buying power, the voting power, and educational power in terms of systemic violence against non-white people in this country. As this conference will show, there are those of us Black vegans and allies who have been engaging in multiple practices entrenched in dismantling systemic and institutionally based racism, quote-unquote, negrophobia, neoliberal whiteness, and speciesism for a long time. We are the continuum of a legacy of anti-racist and anti-white supremacist activists and scholars who have always fought to make it known that Black lives matter. 
These include W.E.B. Du Bois, Asada Shakur, Fannie Lou Hammer, Angela Davis, who was vegan, Morris Dees, Ella Baker, Nina Simone, Bell Hooks, Ida B. Wells, Octava Butler, Audrey Lord, Derek Bell, Peggy McIntosh, James Baldwin, the Black Panther Party, the Kombahi Collective, and the list goes on. Recently, the brilliant and race-conscious Black-identified vegan chef Bryant Terry critiqued how the cookbook Thug Kitchen, which came out in the fall of 2014, was in contradiction to the core themes that can be found in the Black Lives Matter movement. The controversy surrounding Thug Kitchen became a microcosm of how race is lived differently in the USA by white-identified people such as the authors of the book. The authors of the book refuse to acknowledge the dangers of how their own white neoliberal geopolitical status was in collusion with maintaining systemic racism and anti-Black violence. They simply could not reflect on how their use of thug was not innocent, but very much relied on the racialization of thug as a scary Black urban male gangsta. Such denial was a clear indicator by thug kitchen protesters such as Liz Roth and blogger Michael Twitty, that being racialized as white has produced an overwhelmingly large number of white people who simply do not understand how and why thug has been equated with the quote unquote believable myth by the majority of white people that all black and brown people are dangerous and therefore worthy of preemptive strikes via state sanctioned violence or individual stand your ground actions. Liz Ross, our keynote speaker and founder of the Coalition of Anti-Racist Vegans of Color, will talk more about this tomorrow during her keynote speech. Turn the lens on the Black and vegan experience, and one can understand how our collective praxis must embody anti-racism, Black liberation, and the dismantling of white supremacist systems and institutions in a supposedly post-racial era. For example, DJ Kavum, a young Black vegan hip-hop activist out of Denver, Colorado, engages youth with a vegan praxis that's amazing. He lets us know that Black lives matter as he fights food deserts, the prison industrial complex system, police brutality, and health disparities that are the consequences of anti-Black legacies of white supremacist, capitalist-based USA system. Head in the direction of the East Coast of the USA, and we'll find the Afrocentric-based vegan activist, Queen Afua, whose groundbreaking book, Sacred Woman, fused vegan dietary praxis with the acknowledgement that racialized, sexualized violence against Black women and girls cannot be silenced or ignored. Non-Black identified allies such as Dr. Harlan Weaver bring an anti-racist vegan and animal liberation praxis into their work. Dr. Weaver recognizes how cisgender, transgender, racial, and able-bodied identities directly influence the USA's relationship to pit bulls. During this conference, Dr. Weaver will show how the mainstream animal rights and vegan movement's racist response to Michael Vick and his involvement in pit bull dogfighting shows that it was not necessarily Michael Vick that was on trial, but urban hip hop black culture and the quote unquote savage black men is supposedly produced. Weaver's work can be used to understand how a significant number of responses from white animal rights and vegans shows just how much Black lives do not matter to many of their vegan practices. One of the most controversial groups promoting veganism is PETA. They campaign for the liberation of non-human animals by ignoring their own collusion to upholding neoliberal whiteness and racism, as well as transphobic text and imagery to disgust the mainstream into becoming vegetarian or vegan. Whether intended or not, such vegan praxis that drives their campaign strategy negatively affects the lives of transgender people, in particular, Black transgender women such as Cece McDonnell. White vegan ally and transgender rights activist Chris Gayhart has shown their solidarity with Black Lives Matter by campaigning to free Cece McDonnell after she was placed in jail for defending herself from being attacked by a man who hated trans women. Lauren Ornelles, Executive Director of the Food Empowerment Project is a Latina-identified anti-racist vegan. Speaking today, Ornelas has done amazing work in exposing which companies are selling vegan cocoa products at the expense of Black African children. These children have been enslaved to harvest cocoa, even for quote-unquote cruelty-free vegan chocolate bars. Her continued work to expose the cruel practices of modern-day slavery is an impressive example of transcontinental commitment to making sure vegans of the global West and North 
reconsider how they practice cruelty-free consumption beyond was a non-human animal harmed? Food Empowerment Project educates and persuades consumers to come face-to-face -face with the reality that most cocoa comes to them at the expense and the logic of A, Black African lives don't and cannot matter, and B, that this is a larger problem in a racialized food commodity chain in which those who harvest food under the cruelest conditions tend to be the brown and Black people of the world. In continuing with the pro-vegan Black Lives Matter work done by folks such as Liz Ross, Bryant Terry, DJ Kavum, Dr. Harlan Weaver, Lauren Ornelas, DJ Kavum, and Queen Alfua, this conference's workshops and talks will ask these questions and attempt to provide answers or at least the right direction to get a better answer. One, what does a vegan praxis of Black Lives Matter look like? Two, what does veganism that ignores Black Lives Matter look like? And what are the unintended consequences? Three, why do race and whiteness matter and how do they operate? And four, what does allyship look like within the Black Lives Matter movement amongst non-Black vegans and Black non-vegans? Thank you for participating and welcome to the movement. That was the introduction that I laid out for everyone. I'm hoping that it gave comprehensive context for where we're coming from and where we're going to head for the conference today. Just a heads up, we're going to be recording everything. We'll be uploading those PowerPoints with those recordings, and those recordings will be available for an unlimited amount of time, about 36 hours after the conference has taken place.